Kimberly M. Simon, 16, whose body was found off a lonely dirt road yesterday, was strangled. Onada County District Attorney Barry M. Donald, he said today. At around 6 p.m. on September 18, 1985, Kim Simon left her home in Marcy on Route 49, also known as River Road, and began walking down Mohawk Street toward Whitesboro. She planned to meet a friend at the Whitesboro Junior High School, about two miles from her home, and then go for pizza. She never made it. When she didn't return home that evening, her parents notified police, who found her body the next day near the side of a dirt road off Mohawk Street. The day after the homicide, Edward Kaminsky is a Utica attorney, the first lawyer hired to represent Steve. They had a roadblock at Kavanaugh Road and, and uh, River Road. Kavanaugh Road becomes Mohawk Street on the south side of its intersection with Route 49 or River Road. And Steve lived on Kavanaugh Road, above where the, uh, you know, roadblock area. He came through the roadblock initially. They asked him if he knew anything. He said, I, don't, I didn't see anything. I know nothing. Fine. They were looking for her. They were showing pictures on the corner of 49 and Mohawk Street. They asked me if I seen this girl, Cam. I said, no. He went through the roadblock, cooperated with the police, went through the roadblock another time, cooperated with the police. Although current Oneida County District Attorney Scott McNamara was not involved in Steve's prosecution, he's familiar with the details of the case. The third time that he had to go through the roadblock, because he lived on the road, he went around the roadblock. Steve had simply decided to stop for a six-pack of beer. He had just passed the beverage store, so he turned around by cutting through the parking lot of a convenience store on the other side of the street. And there was an uh, unmarked cop car on a payphone there. And it, I just cut through the parking lot, not thinking nothing of it. He just avoided it, set off all kinds of alarms. Oh, my God, was this guy trying to avoid the, the, the roadblock? When he did that, the police noticed it. They put a lot of weight on that. I don't know if I would, but they did. He then became a person of interest, so to say, because of that. They started interviewing him. And ever since that day, it just kept going. <laughs> I was 19 years old at the time. Three days after the murder, they called me up and asked me to come over. I said, no problem. First hour, they were all nice, you know. Then after that, they um, verbally harassed me for hours, asked me where I was on this night. Two officers came in, looked me in the eye, and slammed their hand on the desk and said, you did this. I would argue right back with them, you know, and they fingerprinted me. They took pictures of me. Then I came home that evening and Steve wasn't home and it was kind of strange. He hadn't called in and he hadn't come home for dinner and I was getting kind of nervous. And of course, it was the day before cell phones. I asked for phone calls. I asked to call my mom. I was gone all day. He said I never asked for one. I mean, what 19-year-old kid, when he's getting questioned for a murder, is not going to call his family? He asked for his family a lawyer. They wouldn't let him make a phone call all day long. They had him like there for 12 hours interrogation. Never let him call anybody. Then they took me to a night at the trooper's barracks. I took a polygraph test, and then I went home. And it was like 11 o'clock at night, and he came knocking on our bedroom door, and he goes, Mom, you got to get up. I got a problem, and I opened up the door, and I said, what's the matter? And he says, I've been at the sheriff's department all day. I go, for what? He said, they're questioning me for Kimberly Simon's murder. The results of the polygraph test were inconclusive, but Steve had an alibi. I was home until about 5.30, and then I was stopped at Nimey's gas station, got gas, went to... Uh, Riverside Bowling Alley the whole night. My family owned it, so I was bartending. Ed Lewandrowski. So he would always come in after his job. He was a construction worker. We'd all meet down there. That was the gathering spot. He told them that, he, yes, he had been in the area. He did not see Kimberly. He had stopped and got $5 worth of gas and then drove to the bowling alley. Current Oneida County District Attorney Scott McNamara. They went, they interviewed the gas station attendant, who was a young kid, who told the police that, yes, he knew Steve, he remember pumping the $5 of gas, and that Steve drove to the bowling alley. And everything seems to be good at that point for Steve, I would say. But in 1985, murders were fairly uncommon in Oneida County, especially in the idyllic town of Marcy. This is a horrific crime. You know, it's one of those crimes that it gets the whole community upset, scared. When you're talking about a 16-year-old that's basically snatched off the road, raped, sodomized, and murdered. It's every parent's worst nightmare. Attorney Edward Kaminsky. At the time, this was big news. It was headlines in the paper every single day. Every single day it was in the paper. Everybody was clamoring for a result. We want to find the killer. As the investigation continued, there was a Utica police officer, off-duty Utica police officer, who came forward and said that he was on Mohawk Street the, the night that this happened, and he remembered seeing something that he thought was suspicious. 
he told them that he drove by, he saw a male that would match the description of Steve and that he was next to a pickup truck. Um, he, interestingly enough, was shown a photographic array and did not pick Steve out at the initial stage. Nonetheless, investigators continued to focus on Steve. And they used to follow me around, made my life miserable, talked to a few of my friends, hassled my ex-girlfriend. They constantly watched him. They used to watch my house, sit on top of the hill. They used to follow him down to his girlfriend, call his girlfriend's parents, you know, tell him your daughter's going to be the next one they find in the field dead, and just constantly harassed us, making our life miserable, especially Steve's. They also did, interestingly, they did what, what there was a truck lineup, but Steven's truck was the only one that looked like Steven's truck, and um, that was kind of an interesting thing. And the officer said, yep, that's the pick, red pickup truck I saw. I, during the during the matter, Judge Buckley was the presiding uh, um, uh, judge in the matter. Now he's in the appellate division in New York City. And I showed him a cartoon of a of a of a, a man, a rabbit, and a rock, and with a victim pointing at the man, saying, "That's the man, Your Honor." I mean, this this is what it was. Now the investigation continues for I think like three years. Ultimately, that police officer now picks out Stephen Barnes out of a photo array. What changed in those three years? or what took place when he was being shown that photo array or all of that surrounding stuff. I have no idea. I don't know what all of a sudden made him be able to pick him out where he couldn't pick him out initially. They arrested me on March 25th, 1988. And they come knocking at my front door and the officer said, uh, you remember us? And I said, yeah, how could I forget you? And uh, they said, a few people come forward and pointed the finger at you and you're under arrest. On March 25th, 1988, I walked in the door and my younger son, Sean, was sitting there and he said to me, Mom, they came and picked up Steve. I go, who picked him up? I'm thinking one of his friends, you know. So they came and arrested him for Kimberly Simon's murder. Oh, I was in shock. I was yelling at the officers, screaming. It was, I was with my brother and my girlfriend at the time. They were all freaking out. I didn't want to live. I was devastated. I mean, I was in shock. I couldn't believe it. You know, I just, I, my God, how could they do this, you know? I was, like, stunned. Absolutely stunned. I'm not in the cop car, and I go, I, I can't even believe this is happening. It was the beginning of our 24-year nightmare. 